Hello, and welcome to the Women of the Church study on Ezra and Nehemiah. As we continue our study of the book, uh, the Son of David, seeing Jesus in the historical books, we're nearing the end of our studies, and we're looking forward to this this month. We're looking at Ezra and Nehemiah. So I hope that you'll get your Bible, and if you have a book, get a book, and we'll we'll walk right through um, how Ezra and Nehemiah point us to the true Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Nancy Guthrie starts out talking about sort of um, the unknown periods in our lives that feel a little bit, um, we don't know what that plan is going to be next and how we make these great desires to do certain things and then we commit and then all of a sudden things fizzle out, our hearts are not in it and we, we find ourselves distracted and unable to follow through, drifting away, unanchored um, to God even in our pursuit of Him. And so she refers back to the people of God in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. She says they were far away from the land that God had promised to dwell with them. Remember that they were in exile in Babylon and they were not in Jerusalem with the temple that they had built. 500 miles east of Jerusalem and Babylon and in the heart of the world, which I love that phrase, the heart of the world, sort of at the center of all things worldly or pagan and corrupt in an environment designed to assimilate them. I'm gonna pause right there and just think about our world today, right? We talk a lot about the, you know, the, the pain of our world, the brokenness of our world, and how hard it is as people to, who follow Jesus to live in a world like this. Um, but we are constantly direct, distracted and surrounded by, quote, the world. And no matter where you live in the world nowadays, we have technology and other things that we're able to access instantly that show us the darkness of our world. And back in, in the times of the people of, of Israel, Babylon was sort of a central place for that. Jerusalem seemed like more of a holy city, a place where they were able to connect with God. It was the promised city with the holy temple. But Babylon was far from that and it was removed. And the Babylonian regime had brought them far from home and mixed them with people from other conquered territories and even given them Babylonian names in place of their Hebrew names so that they would leave behind their old lives, their old language, their old ways, and their old gods. So it was kind of like they were drawing them away from their roots, drawing them away from the God that they had known and worshipped and tried to sort of assimilate them into a new world. Think about that in your own life. Maybe this is a good opportunity to discuss with your, with your groups. When is it that you have felt maybe in your life that you've been pulled away from that anchor, um, that you're kind of adrift and maybe it was in college and you were in a sorority that you felt like it was not you know, a really positive place for you. Although I was in a sorority and mine was a very positive, so I'm not saying that sororities aren't, but um, maybe you've been surrounded by friends or family at a time that have, have felt like they were, the bad influence that they were having on you created sort of a drift for you with your relationship with God. Where in your life have you experienced that? And you can relate to these, these, these followers of of God that were pulled away and, and assimilated into a whole different culture and a whole different life. Then a new regime came into power. The Persians overtook the Babylonians and they had a completely different strategy when it came to the conquered people and lands. Now this is interesting to note. The Babylonians sort of tried to infiltrate and assimilate them into the Babylonian culture and life away from the God of Israel. But instead, the Persians did a little bit differently. Instead of importing them, they allowed them to live in their own land where they were more likely to be productive and produce tax revenue. Instead of forcing them to accept a new set of gods, they were happy to simply add the God of the conquered people to their own panoply of gods. So again, they were sort of allowing them to be who they were as God's chosen people, yet they were using them and abusing them to produce for, the, for them as the Persians and then they were introducing, okay, you can worship your own God, but we have all these other gods too. And so it wasn't a soul worship of the God of Israel. And so we open Ezra, um, and it says it was once the book with Nehemiah, and they go together to give us the whole story of the return of the exiles. So again, they were pushed out of their land, overtaken by the Babylonians, and now this is the story of when they return. And they come home from Babylon to Jerusalem. So this is sort of a renewal story, sort of a restoration to their own land. Um, God's strategy to bring them back to their land is being, you know, being um, manifest through a human king. He's at work in his people 
to bring to bring them home and um, he brings them through God's plans include many more years of exile before the people would get to go home to Jerusalem the years of enslavement <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> ahead of them would certainly not seem like plans for welfare and not for evil he refers to Jeremiah who prophecies that God is going to take care of his people, even in Babylon, that he's going to bring them back to their land. But it doesn't seem that way at the time. It seems that they're still stuck in this exile. And what, why is this going to be prophetess, profiting to me? Why is this going to be prosperous for me? Because I'm not in my homeland. But God has a bigger plan than even that we can see. I love this. She writes, so we see that this is not a promise that the plans God has for the years of our lives on earth are going to fit our description of good. Sometimes God's goodness is different, excuse me, than what we see as good. And that's really hard for our minds to grapple with. Well, what we see as good should be what God sees as good. But God's view and vision of our lives and of the world is so much greater and so much bigger than anything we can ask for or imagine. It might not what be what we're hoping for. And it might not be the path that we had planned or what we thought was good. But it'll be even better in the, in the future, in the long run, in eternity. Right now, it might not feel good. Like the Babylon, like the Drew, uh, Jews being in exile in Babylon, but God's plan will prevail, and His good it will be for His good. They were in exile for seventy years. Imagine that seventy years. It feels like it'll never end, and your kids and your kids' kids feel like, man, are we ever going to get out of this? And a lot of people didn't see um, reunion with their home. They were stuck in that exile until they died. It was a lifetime of not getting what they hoped for, but God's plan prevailed. She writes that going back to Jerusalem is not just a geographical location, relocation, it's a personal transformation, a whole life reorientation away from the world that wants to assimilate them and toward the city of God where God wants to sanctify them to himself. When we talk about repentance, we talk a lot about turning away from our sin and literally turning completely around away from sin and turning towards God. So similarly, it's the, as if these Jerusalem people, these Jewish people were turning away from where they were in Babylon and turning towards God in Jerusalem. And God was doing that work. It wasn't just physical, but it was a personal heart transformation of no longer being associated with the gods of the Babylonians, but being turned back towards the one true God, sanctifying them as they grew and grew towards God. Going back to Jerusalem, these, these are descendants of the chosen people, of Abraham's people, and God gave the promise of the land and they were returning to that promise. God's promise was true and they had maybe lost sight of that over the many years in exile, but God was bringing them back in. She notes that, this is really interesting as she lists as the list of names of the descendants that were brought back in. It's important to, to rest your eyes over those names. It's easy to skip over that. But she writes that it's important to see that God values the people. They're not nameless and faceless, but they are truly his chosen people. And he likes to keep lists of those who are his people because people as a group matter to him. They, the, the individuals matter to him. So he, he names them by name in this scripture. To go from Babylon to Jerusalem is to go from being scattered to being gathered. Again, like that flock of sheep, they're scattered about and the good shepherd comes and gathers them back up and brings them in. They go from being alienated and pushed away and sort of in exile to finally re-accepted from outcast to the favored child. We can all feel that, right? We've all felt like the alien or the outcast or the outsider. But when, we've, when we're brought back in, there's nothing more special than feeling like you're part of things, like God loves you enough to bring you back into his fold, to bring you back to him, even though you've gone astray, maybe you've messed up, maybe you've gone far away, God brings you back home. It's a personal transformation towards God. Again, that repentance, it's a whole change of our mindsets, of our heart sets, of the way that we're looking at the world and the way that we encounter our sin. God is shaping us and transforming us by the power of his spirit to bring us back to him.
He calls his people to worship. The temple, remember, had been destroyed in Jerusalem. For 70 years, there had been no sacrifices offered for sin, no priests carrying their concerns into God's presence. Remember, this is before Jesus. There was This is when they were still having to follow the law, and the law had said that they needed priests to make sacrifices to atone for their sins. Um, there had been no blood sprinkled, no incense being burned, no lamps being lit, no bread being placed and replaced on the table. They had to rebuild the temple. Under the leadership of Zerubbabel, they began laying the foundation for rebuilding the temple. Clearly, the priority of those returning to Jerusalem was to restore the worship of God. So they had a focus here. They were bringing back in, not just to go home to a land, but to restore that heart, the the, the center of their worship, and the, and the way that they could know that they knew how to worship God was through the temple. But as they started to rebuild, there began opposition. Think about that for a minute in our own lives. As we, we kind of go astray, we feel alienated, we're pushed out. As we come back in, sometimes we feel opposition. Maybe it's from family members. Maybe it's from friends. Maybe it's from others. As we make a change in our lives, sometimes that makes others around us who've been used to the way we've been living apart from God uncomfortable. Maybe they don't like the way that we have changed our habits. Maybe they have lost their drinking partner. Maybe they've lost the person that they can gossip with. Maybe they've lost that person that has been negative with them and they're they're not knowing how to handle a new way of you as you've chosen to live differently or of, of me. And there can be some opposition. Maybe Maybe you've lost friends when you've chosen to live a different way. Maybe you've lost family members when you've said, you know what, I'm going to follow Jesus and that's going to be, that's going to look different for me in my life. The people who had moved into and around Jerusalem during the exile criticized and intimidated the returnees and frustrated their plans that it took 20 years for the temple to be rebuilt and for the temple worship to be restored. But finally the day came. So they were putting stops in their tracks. These people had moved into Jerusalem while the Jewish people were in exile and they had sort of gotten comfortable in that land. And so as, as these people were returning and, and the Jewish people were returning and building the, the temple, they were like, wait a minute, this is different. This is not what we've been doing and get out of our way sort of. And there was opposition and that can be really hard. It can be really frustrating. It can be really tempting to give up. It can be really tempting to say, forget it. You know, I'm just going to go back to the easier way of living, you know, without God. But God was with them, and God's promises prevailed. The book of Nehemiah, she shifts now to the book of Nehemiah, takes her focus back to the place where hundreds of thousands of exiles were still living, including a man named Nehemiah, who had risen to the trusted position of cupbearer to the king of Persia. Remember, the Persians had taken over the Babylonians, and they had a new regime and a new way of um, incorporating the people of Israel back into their land and using them sort of for their own profit. Through Nehemiah's whole life, had though Nehemiah's whole life had been spent in Babylon, his heart was firmly planted in Jerusalem. The temple had been rebuilt, but without a wall around it, the city was still defenseless. And so um, Nehemiah was allowed to return to Jerusalem with the blessing of the king, and he discovered that the description that his brother had given him of the city of Jerusalem had not fully captured the reality of the ruined city, and Jerusalem was a fallen and charred heap of rubble. Imagine the distress that Nehemiah would have felt coming in. Giant stones that had once been embedded in the city's great wall lay half buried and embedded in the earth, and the grass had grown tall around them. Nehemiah surveyed the once glorious city, but Nehemiah saw it all through the lens of the promises of God. He saw it differently. He looked at the stones and saw them as a picture of the people of God, broken down, needing to be reclaimed and restored. So Nehemiah gathered the priests, the nobles, the officials, and those who were to do the work. And they were focused on rebuilding the wall. 52 days. There were no cranes, no cement trunks. Everyone was part of the work crew. God had brought his people home and he was at work in and through them and they built the wall. So Nehemiah accomplished his goal there through the, through the hand of God. God had called his people to worship and he built and secured a city for them, a place where they could dwell. He could dwell with them and he wanted to speak his word. All the people, the men and women and children who were old enough to have to understand, gathered to listen to Ezra, read to them from Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, the whole Pentateuch and Deuteronomy. 
and they listened all day long and the voice of the living God speaks and they're understanding and they're drawn to him. Again, they had been alienated, outcast, distracted by these other gods in Babylon and totally living a different world for 70 years. Some of them had never lived in the promised city of Jerusalem and he was calling them back in and he, and he provided for them. It blessed them and they came to their knees in worship. They were, let, they were confronted with their sin, and they confessed it, and they were called to action. Remember, in Joshua, when they claimed their land for the first time many years before, God had said, drive out the Canaanites. Do not intermarry with them. And they didn't always do that. And here we are still seeing the results of those choices. And so God repeated his commands to them. Devote the Canaanites to destruction so they would not intermarry with them and begin to worship their gods. God is repeating his call to them to say, drive out those who are distracting you, those who are worshiping other gods. And so the Israelites finally separated themselves. It was costly obedience. They had to get rid of something in order to cling to God. This was a rigorous response to God's command to be holy and set apart. Again, like we talked about a few moments ago, sometimes when we make the decision to follow Christ, we have to give something up. Often we do. And our comfort, our friends, our family, maybe our jobs, maybe what we are doing day to day, we have to give something up and that can be really painful. But God is honored in that. If it's, if it's God's call for our lives and we, we understand that this commanded separation well, it's not a racial issue. She makes clear to say that they weren't, he was, God was not saying separate from these people because they're dirty and bad as racially, you know, bad people, but because they were religiously different and he wanted them to be separate. But, and not, it wasn't the, that don't go evangelize to them because he knew that they would be pulled down by them rather than boosted up by them and that they really needed that separation. They needed to be set apart from them, separating themselves from foreign wives who had not forsaken their false gods, but had brought have brought their own gods, carved idols and deviant sexual practices. Again, this is a theme we've seen all throughout the historical books that these Israelite people were easily swayed away from the run, one true God. They didn't, God did not want them to mix marriages. They had come home from Babylon to Jerusalem. They, Jerusalem, they had turned their back on the world and its idolatrous ways. And now it was time to fully commit and be obedient to the God that they love and the God that had kept his promises. This is big news and it's big news for them. It's big news for us. It's a great reminder for us to turn away from our sin and turn towards God, truly worshiping him. And for us, for our sake, we have the gift of Jesus Christ. We have the gift of the one true once and for all sacrifice. We don't have to rebuild the temple because we know that Jesus is the one that sacrificed himself so that we don't have to continue to sacrifice. We know that we have grace when we do turn away from God so that we might turn back towards him. We know that the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives because Jesus promised that spirit when he was a resurrected when he was a, when he ascended into heaven. And Jesus continues his redeeming work for us, not only now in our lives, but forever into eternity. God brings us back to him through Jesus Christ. As we celebrate this month, Easter, Jesus' resurrection, we have hope for a future. And we have hope that even when we're distracted, even when we're pulled away, that God brings us back to him, that we're forgiven through the death of Christ, through his resurrection to new life, that we too can share in that new life. She ends like this. Nancy says, if you find yourself far away from God, won't you set out today to come home? Jesus is calling you home. Don't wait any longer. You will not find an impenetrable wall, but open arms. He is not looking for perfect people who show no signs of being burned by this world. He takes ruined stones and builds them into the kind of place in which he intends to dwell forever. That is God's promise. Not that you have to be perfect. Not that you have to earn his love. Not that you have to sacrifice for him at the temple day in and day out for the sins that you've given. He has given the once and for all sacrifice Jesus Christ for you and for me. No matter how far away we go. God is welcoming us back into his arms.
as his chosen and beloved children. He, she ends with the gray box, as always. God is making a holy city, the new Jerusalem. When we look back to the old Jerusalem, we see destruction. We see despair. We see rebuilding. We see restoration. But we also see pain and brokenness. His holy city comes out of our brokenness. His holy city comes out of our God-defying, Christ-rejecting city of man. Our church is a broken place made, made up of not perfect people, but of forgiven sinners. And through us, he makes a new city because of Jesus Christ. There is nothing so evil or irredeemable in our lives, nothing so unworthy about our lives that cannot even now be fashioned into the foundation stones of the city of heaven. All of those who set their face to go to the new Jerusalem by joining themselves to Christ will one day be welcomed in. Friends, you are welcomed in. Turn towards God. Run to him. Receive his forgiveness and his grace and enter in with Jesus. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you for hope in your promises. We thank you for Jesus Christ, your son, dying for us so that we might have new life, forgiven lives, ready to serve you. Use us, forgive us, shower us with your grace, overflow us with your love so that more might know of this hope in you. We thank you for your love. It's in your son, Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Thanks, friends. We'll see you next month.